We're now turning uh, to our maritime panel. Uh, so these are the shippy guys. Um, and we're going to turn to the issues raised by vulnerable infrastructure relating to ports, seaports, and maritime trade as impacted by climate change. So I'm going to again just very briefly introduce your moderator and panel. Uh, you can read their full bios in the program. Uh, then we'll proceed to the presentations and hold all questions until we're done with that. So without further ado, our moderator today is my good colleague, Mike Daly. He's an attorney at Pierce Atwood, practicing in their Providence office. Uh, Mike is an alum of the Roger Williams University School of Law, as well as the University of Rhode Island Marine Affairs, our joint degree program. Uh, he's also adjunct faculty here at the law school, so we're delighted to have Mike back. First, we're going to hear from Mike Savonis. Uh, he's currently a fellow at ICF International, which is uh, a large firm, and he's an internationally recognized expert on adapting transportation systems to climate change. Uh, he served as a senior policy advisor and in other capacities for 19 years at the Federal Highway Administration, uh, and has really helped spearhead establishment of a lot of thinking about transportation systems and climate change. His presentation is entitled, The Impacts of Climate Change on Ports, Examples from the U.S. and Around the Globe. Climate change is likely to have a profound impact on ports and port facilities around the world. Why? Because they're on the water. Uh, significant investment is necessary to adapt to the changing climate and build resilience in these critical freight gateways. Next, we're going to hear from Austin Becker. He's a PhD candidate at Stanford University in the Emmett Interdisciplinary Program in Environmental and Resources, where his research explores avenues to build resilience against national, natural disasters and coastal infrastructure systems. Uh, prior to that, he, we are happy to give him a reason to come back home, so to speak. He worked for Rhode Island Sea Grant and the University of Rhode Island's Coastal Resources Center on Policy for Working Waterfronts and Ports. His talk today is entitled, Hurricane Consequences in the Face of Climate Change. I'm sorry, Dave, we're probably going to see more maps of hurricanes. Um, a case study of a seaport cluster, and he's going to examine both the ports of Gulfport, Mississippi, and Providence, Rhode Island, just up the road, to explore the wide variety of impacts that can result from natural disasters, such as hurricanes, Katrina, or Sandy, on a seaport clustered center of stakeholders. Then we're going to hear from Ron Beck. Ron Beck is the first Coast Guard District's Program Manager for Coastal Energy Projects, including LNG facilities and offshore renewable energy initiatives. He also serves on a whole lot of bodies where a whole lot of the same people <laughs> seem to serve. They just move the meeting to different places. Uh, he represents the Coast Guard and the Bureau of Ocean Energy and Management State Task Force up here in New England. He's also a member of the Northeast Regional Ocean Council, and he's also the Coast Guard's representative to the Northeast Regional Planning Body. He's going to address, and I'm not sure how you're going to do all this in 15 minutes, Ron, but <laughs> I'm just going to be watching, just letting you know. Uh, impacts of climate change and sea level rise at Coast Guard facilities, the resilience of the marine transportation system, inundation of I-95 highway and rail systems, the opening up of the Northwest Passage and other Alaskan climate change impacts, offshore renewable energy initiatives, emission control areas, and coastal marine spatial planning. See? 15 minutes. I don't know. Finally, we're going to wrap up with Paul Heilman. He's a partner at Saul Ewing and has been there in its D.C. predecessor firm since 1983. And during that time, he's represented port authorities on the Atlantic, Gulf, and Pacific coasts in a number of, of maritime matters. Uh, he's been doing a lot of work lately on greenhouse gas emissions, including advising ports on compliance with regulations, limiting access for non-green trucks, and requiring shore power for container ships, as well as issues relating to slow steaming for container ships. He's going to address recent greenhouse gas emission regulations covering port trucking and vessel emissions. He's also going to look at various green port initiatives and the impact of the alliance of environmental groups and organized labor in the port trucking arena and what this means for ports and the shipping industry. So let's welcome Mike Savonis to the stage first. Thank you very much, Susan. It's a, a real pleasure to be here this afternoon. I'm sorry that I missed uh, many of the earlier sessions. Um, but I was meeting earlier with uh, Jared Rhodes. Uh, Jared is the chief of uh, the planning division in the statewide planning area for the uh, state of Rhode Island. And I went to speak with Jared and tell him just how my firm can help him. And instead, I walked away learning how much Rhode Island is already doing and how, how high the awareness is of climate impacts here. 
Um, I promised to do a little bit on freight, and after our last presentation where we heavily focused on the legal aspects, it's probably important to take a deep breath and, and switch over to some of the more practical impl implications of climate change. So I promised to, to give a brief overview of the U.S. freight system. And one of the things that I want you to all recognize is the U.S. freight system is awfully big. Um, in 2007, the freight system moved 50 million tons worth $45 billion per day. Now in transportation, that's a big number. And I think most of us would agree with that. What goes through ports is a significant share of that, certainly a smaller share, but a significant share. Waterborne freight was about 2.6 billion tons uh, per year. That's for the year. It's a massively interconnected system. And when you look at a port, it is the ships, of course, moving up to the docks. It's the offloading equipment. It is the uh, storage equipment on the, in the port itself, as well as the hinterland connections, being able to get the stuff out of the port. And, and the thing I just want you to remember is that it's a highly interconnected system, and that if any piece of that system goes down, the service is no longer provided, and it can have important implications for the port. Um, I, I understand that you've already gone through some of the climate impacts already. Um, I, I work for a, I work in a very conservative area. The transportation community tends to be all, basically all from Missouri. They all believe that you have to show me. Well, the latest information that we have on climate impacts does in fact show us. Observed changes are already underway. This is uh, the chart on the right, and you can read the, the list of impacts, but the, the chart on the right is sea level rise that's already occurred through 2000, 2007, I believe, 2006, I'm sorry. And you can see that those big red arrows in the Gulf Coast um, represent about eight inches of sea level rise that have already occurred. And of course, there's more to come. Uh, floods and droughts have become more common. What's shown on the map on the left is the incidence of heavy downpours. And again, this is what's already occurred in the historical record. Heavy downpours are up 67% in the Northeast. And again, it's, predict it's, predicted, it's projected to increase with climate changes, which will have important implications. And then finally, and I'm not going to go through a whole lot of this, this is the last one. Uh, increases in extreme heat will limit operations and damage some roads and rail. And if you look at the lower map there of the United States, um, that heavy red in the southern tip of Texas and in the southeastern United States, that's more than 180 days per year above 100 degrees. That's hot. That is under the higher emission scenario. That perhaps is the good news. The bad news is, is that we are already outpacing the higher emissions scenario. This will also have important implications. Now, all of this is from a US government report that came out in 2009 from the Global Change Research Program. It's called the Second National Climate Assessment and uh, has the, the full sanction of the US government. Looking for impacts, um, you don't have to look far. Superstorm Sandy shut down the, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. Um, much to their dismay, the Port of Virginia was quite gleeful in, ha in happily picking up the additional service that they had to provide. Um, you know, you can never link a single storm to climate change. However, some interesting things are being uh, done in the scientific community to link the pattern of change to the anticipated changes in climate change. So you can't link that single storm, but you certainly can link patterns to climate change. Okay, um, starting in about 2008, we started understanding what the impacts on ports are likely to be. Uh, the Transportation Research Board issued Special Report 290, and it said, among other things, it was about um, all modes of transportation, it said six of the nation's top 10 freight gateways are at risk from sea level rise. Interestingly, it also looked at other ports, ports that aren't on the ocean. And it said that dry conditions could actually lead to low water levels, which we've seen on the Mississippi River, um, and that would continue to impede operations. 
As we've just seen, extreme weather threatens structures. It certainly threatens the power supply and the supply chain of goods coming in through the country. And heat events increase the need for refrigerated storage. So you have this negative feedback loop. Because it's hotter, you need more refrigerated storage. Because you need more refrigerated storage, you put out more greenhouse gases. It's really a no-win situation. Why does this matter? Well, we're learning more and more as time goes on. And this is a, a rather, well, it's, it's not even a comprehensive list, but it's a, a short list of some of the port impacts of climate, uh, climate change impacts on ports. What happens with more hot days? Well, asphalt deteriorates. It wears out more quickly. You get thermal expansion of bridge joints, which can increase, that increase damages, uh, damage to the bridge structures. With higher wind speeds, you get more damage. You get more wind, uh, sign da signage damage, uh, and you have the need for stronger materials. With more intense precipitation, of course, you get more flooding. Not a, not a big surprise there. But for ports that are on rivers, you can have bridges being undermined and scour, uh, bridge scour increasing so that it damages the bridge itself and requires replacement more frequently. We anticipate that coastal storms will intensify. We can't say much about the, in, uh, the frequency of those coastal storms, but we certainly can say a little bit about the increased intensity. And as we have seen with Superstorm Sandy, uh, Katrina, Rita, Ike, um, certainly storms are getting a bit stronger. And then finally, sea level rise, probably the most important impact, but a, sl a slow, longer-term impact that leads to permanent inundation. So I want to tell you about a couple of case studies. Actually, I think I have uh, four of them. The first is dates from 2008. It's a, the Gulf Coast study, a study that I led um, that examined the impacts of climate change for all modes of transportation, but I'll just show you some of the, the impacts on the marine transportation. We chose the Gulf Coast study because it's very important to the United States as a whole. It carries 40% of the marine tonnage, uh, of the tonnage that really goes out of the country. It's from the breadbasket going down the Mississippi River and out to uh, other locales. But it also takes in about two thirds, a little less than two thirds of the oil imports coming into the country. We always think about the big ports. You know, what's the, the, the South Louisiana outer port or the port of New York and New Jersey or LA and Long Beach. But look at all the different cargo handling facilities along the rivers and along the coasts. It's a big impact when these smaller facilities are flooded as well. So one of the things we looked at was relative sea level rise. Uh, here's a picture of present day. Um, you can't really tell from this slide, but there are areas that are already below mean sea level in the New Orleans area and the Louisiana and the Gulf Coast area. We looked at two scenarios, two and four feet of sea level rise. Now, we didn't choose those willy-nilly. It wasn't pulled out of the air. We worked with uh, climate scientists. We looked at the, the fact that the land is sinking in the Gulf Coast, and we added those together and said two to four feet look like fairly reasonable estimates. Well, under that, we have dramatic impacts in the Gulf Coast. More than 2,400 miles of major roadway, 2,400 miles of major roadway, 25% of the major roads in that study area would be permanently inundated with four feet of sea level rise. Three quarters of the cargo handling facilities would be permanently flooded. This isn't science fiction. In fact, when we did our study in 2008, we based it on the fourth assessment from the IPCC, which assumed an overall sea level rise of 7 to 23 inches. The U.S. Global Change Research Program report in 2009 raised that significantly, saying 3 to 4 feet, 36 to 48 inches. So those 2 to 4 feet uh, of sea level rise that we anticipated is almost certainly a conservative estimate. We also looked at storm surge. We looked at 18 and 23 feet of storm surge in the study area. Um, to give you some context, Hurricane Katrina was 28 feet at, at landfall. So again, we thought we were being conservative. And you can see that vast areas of that study area between Houston and Mobile are subject to uh, temporary flooding from storm surge. 
It's also interesting to note that there's very little difference between 18 and 23 feet of sea level rise in the area. The whole area is very low lying. So the difference in five feet of storm surge in that particular area makes relatively a small difference. Our studies continue uh, with ICF um, in the port of Mobile, Alabama. We wanted to focus down and start looking more uh, concertedly at uh, a particular locale, and we chose uh, Mobile, Alabama. Uh, it's a fairly important point port, uh, 67 million tons of cargo. It's a multifaceted port. Um, what they are telling us, and this is a, a big improvement, that the port managers are beginning to recognize the threat that climate change poses to them, um, that they are very concerned about intermodal connectivity. They're less concerned with the hardscape of the port, the docks, the, the, the storage facilities, and the like, but intermodal co connectivity is a big concern for them because they won't be able to get the cargo out. And it differs by service. Some of the things we learned in this, uh, containers can flood during storms. Of course, that's a big, big concern. Um, wind can kick up dust uh, at a coal terminal. And then rains can increase dredging costs, all of which are big concerns for uh, a business like the port. Now, generally speaking, they feel pretty comfortable in their ability to handle uh, large storms, but they are concerned about damage to, to cargo and piers and buildings. And their biggest concern is really structural. When the cranes go down, they uh, have a big problem on their hands. We are continuing that study. Um, we're beginning to look at synergistic impacts. A lot of the modeling to date has been kind of single entity. We look at storm surge or we look at sea level rise. What happens when you put the two together, when you have a higher volume of water and a more intense storm coming through there? And uh, hopefully in about six months or a year, I'll be able to report to you about those. Um, the Port of Los Angeles did a study. Uh, the RAND Corporation did it for them. The Port of Los Angeles is the largest container port in the country. It sits right next to the second largest container port in the country, in the Port of Long Beach. Um, they looked at a, a variety of scenarios with uh, no sea level rise. Now, in yellow, you can see the outline of the hardscape of the port. Off to the right is the, is the port of Long Beach that's not shown. And with one meter of sea level rise, you see that the hinterland, it's not the port itself that's flooded. It's the hinterland that, that starts getting flooded. And with two meters of sea level rise, it's just that much more extensive. If any part of the system goes down, essentially the entire system goes down. Another example comes from the, the Felix Stowe Dock and Railway Facility in the UK. Um, this is the largest container port in the UK. They were required to do the study under the Climate Change Act of 2008. This was done by the UK Climate Impacts Program in conjunction with the port. And they found uh, some pretty significant impacts that they were concerned about but as it turns out, weren't that significant to their operation. They were concerned about power outages. Uh, Felix Stowe gets its power off port. And so if the surrounding power supply goes down, they go down as well. That's a big concern. Uh, they're worried about crane and pilot delays, and of course, they're worried about the port closure. This is one of the advances in the assessment that we've been able to, to identify as a community. Um, this is a risk assessment methodology. It's one of the ways of beginning to, to deal with the uncertainties of climate change. Now risk, as you may know, is the product of uh, the probability of an event happening and its consequence in dollars. The problem with doing that kind of a thing is that we don't really know what the probability is and even the consequences are a little hard to estimate. So what they've done in Felix though is they've done a qualitative assessment and what those numbers on the right signify are what their estimate of the likelihood of an event happening and the magnitude of that event. Now as you see from the lower left, um, they indicated what the, the consequences or the risks actually would be. Zero to five being inconsequential, inconsequential, up to 20 to 25, very high. And in fact, Felix Stowe found only moderate impacts and mostly at the current day. And the reason they found moderate impacts is that, well, 
Climate impacts depend on place. And up in the UK, they don't have very severe storms, as compared to the Gulf Coast at least. They do have sea level rise, but they feel like they can handle it. And they have greater adaptive capacity because they're already anticipating some of these impacts. So if you look at the, the difference between the white, the blue, and the red bars, the consequences and the risks actually go down. That's because they feel that they will be adapting over time and will be able to handle it. An important lesson for a lot of us in the US, I think, sometimes. Um, Austin Becker and I, I think the first time we met was, was in Geneva at the UN Conference on Trade and Development. Uh, again, it's the growing interest of the community in port impacts. Uh, the UN was has held three expert meetings in 2009 to 2011, uh, in addition to UNCTAD, the UN Economic Commission for Europe is also very interested, and we'll hold a meeting in March where the two of us will once again hold the Austin and Mike show. <laughs> but in Geneva last year, we saw presentations on Durban, Hamburg, Mauritius, Car the, the Caribbean generally, Tokyo, San Diego, the Gulf Coast, and Cartagena. And it really just reflects how much of a concern this really is to the community. I'm just going to show you very briefly um, uh, Port Moyes del Bosque in Cartagena. And I'm going to skip because I'm being told to stop right now. Uh, very quickly, looking at the impacts. And the reason I wanted to show you this is twofold. One is that it's the International Finance Corporation of the World Bank doing this study. Uh, secondly is that they actually did a financial analysis. Now, it's a little hard to see, but in the top center, you can see that the causeway is flooded. Again, it's the hinterland connections, the intermodal connections that are flooding, and a little bit on port with the bulk park cargo storage area. But what they actually did was looked at three different scenarios and said, what is the port's ability to grow cargo, to continue to service a, a, a greater and greater amount of cargo? So if you look at the graph on the right-hand side, you see that Cartagena is expected to increase its handling rate of cargo significantly. And it will reach a maximum up around uh, 30, $35 million worth of cargo, 30 to $35 million worth of cargo, in a short time. That's the blue bar with no sea level rise. However, with significant sea level rise and with accelerated sea level rise, you're going to see the yellow bar. And they're going to go from a significant increase in cargo handling ability to know cargo handling ability. So with that, let me just quickly wrap up before Susan gets too mad at me. Um, freight is a growing part of the US economy. The US economy depends on consumer spending. And where does it come from? It comes through the ports. It's made in other places, typically. It comes in and we buy it. Uh, the continuity of operations of port facilities is critical. And the climate impacts on those ports is already happening and is expected to get worse. We're learning more every day. The bad news is, is that as we learn more, we anticipate even more, uh, more severe impacts. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mike. You've set, set me up nicely. Um, so I'm Austin Becker. I'm, uh, I'm a PhD candidate in my fifth year in an um, interdisciplinary program in environment and resources. And so I kind of span engineering, policy, climate science, and I approach all of those from a social science perspective. Um, and for the past four years, I've been looking at the impacts of climate change on the coastal built environment, and in particular focusing on seaports. And I'll talk today about uh, the two case studies that I've been working on in uh, Gulfport, Mississippi, and here in Providence, Rhode Island. And before I get into the heart of this, I want to just give a quick little background timeline. Um, 2005, we all remember Hurricane Katrina. Uh, 
It hit the, the Gulf Coast, uh, causing about $80 billion of damage. It hit the port of Gulfport, Mississippi in particular. Uh, totally devastated the port. I mean, they had 28 to 30 feet of storm surge. Everything on the port was wiped out. Um, they estimated about $51 million in just direct damages to the structures. Um, the effects of that lasted quite a long time. That immediately had a decrease in their revenues by 70%, and even five years later, they were only at about 80% of the capacity that they were at before Katrina. A year after Katrina, the port got about $600 million in federal money to rebuild and restore the port. And part of that money was to be used to build the, the hurricane resistance of the port. And they chose a strategy of elevation. They decided that they wanted to take the port from its current elevation of 10 feet above uh, mean sea level to a new elevation of 25 feet. So, this gets them out of the floodplain for the most part. Of course, Katrina was 28 feet, so there's questions, was 25 feet the right number or not? But that's what they went with. Um, and in fast forward to three weeks ago, we had Superstorm Sandy, which I witnessed via the internet from the West Coast. Um, and, uh, you know, the damage estimates are somewhere in, I don't know, the $50 billion range for the, for the area here. And ironically, on the Monday of Superstorm Sandy, as it was bearing down on New York, New Jersey, the Port Commission in Gulfport, Mississippi, was having their meeting in which they decided to abandon their plan to elevate the port. Uh, so because they were having a hard time making this project go as quickly as they had hoped, they decided to take that $140 million that was going to go towards elevation and to put it into other projects which would generate jobs and profit in the short term. So at first I thought, wow, this really kind of screws up my research. I've been, uh, <laughs> I chose that port because of this elevation strategy, which was pretty, you know, it's pretty unheard of for a port to do that. Um, but I think it actually um, brings home a lot of the messages that, that I've been working on in, in the research I've been doing. So I'll talk about that today. Um, first, a framework for, for thinking about sector scale adaptation. Um, we'll zoom in on Gulfport and Providence and talk about the, the, the consequences of these kinds of storm events in these two port sectors. Um, and then I'll, I'll hit some of the lessons learned in, uh, uh, just in Gulfport for now. So a lot to cover. I'll try to go quickly. So I'm proposing this, this framework for thinking about adaptation for sectors. So instead of thinking about adaptation on a, on a state level or even a national level or on an individual facility level, I think it's important to think about um, a particular use like a port or an airport or a utility and what the cluster of stakeholders is that centers around that use. And that, that's a really critical first step in adaptation planning. Once, once you have that cluster identified, you go to that cluster, talk to them about what they consider the consequences and risks from whatever climate change impact you're concerned with. Talk to them about the strategies that might be available, uh, not just for the facility itself, but again, from the perspective of that whole stakeholder network. Assess those strategies against the various uh, risks, assign leadership, and, and determine some timelines for implementation. And in the re research that I've been doing so far, I've really been focusing on these first two steps of this, um, of this framework process. So first is thinking about a particular use like a port as a cluster of stakeholders. And then, and then going to that cluster and, and talking to them about what they, what they consider the consequences of climate change impacts, in this case, storm impacts, uh, to be. So again, I'm working in two ports, um, Providence, Provport, uh, which is a private port run by Waterson Terminal Services um, up, in, up, up the bay here, and Gulfport, Mississippi. These are two small to medium-sized ports. Um, they're not the... the huge ports that are doing, you know, hundreds of thousands of tons of throughput. Um, but they're both very vulnerable ports. They're, they're, um, they're both in areas where they could see significant storm surges. We saw it in Gulfport a few times over the last hundred years, most re recently Katrina. Providence, you know, projections are we could see with a Category 3 storm, possibly storm surges of 20 feet 
um, maybe more. So Gulfport, of course, has had a major storm like this in recent memory. Providence has not. 1954 was the last really, really big one that impacted the area. Um, so first, the first step here was, was determining who makes up this cluster um, of around the port. And you know, clusters often are used to just, to just define the, the firms, like the, the businesses that make up a, a cluster around some particular use. Like, so I, th I think historically a port cluster would have just been the businesses at the port itself. I'm kind of expanding that to think about all of the stakeholders that have some uh, interest in the long-term functioning of this, of this facility. So start, it, you know, start out with the, with the usual suspects here, the port authority itself, the tenants at the port, the insurance company, um, quite a few uh, state agencies, DOT, the emergency management agency in, in Providence and in Rhode Island. Um, oops, I'm sorry, this is Gulfport, not Providence. Uh, so uh, DOT down in Gulfport, emergency management in, um, in Gulfport and for the state. A uh, couple of federal agencies were identified, and, and this is by the stakeholders themselves using a snowball sample approach where I just ask them uh, who should be concerned with the long-range resilience of the port. So the Army Corps, the Coast Guard, uh, local city of Gulfport, and, and some nonprofit and academic types. And I conducted interviews uh, of this stakeholder cluster. There were about 30 uh, 30 interviews altogether, and I talked to them about what they consider the consequences of a hypothetical storm event to be. So something a little bit stronger than Katrina, but you know around the same scale. And I presented them with that scenario, which looks like this. Uh, so this is a Category Four hurricane, and uh, this is the storm surge with some 3D buildings that we dropped on there just for for scale. And I asked them, what, are the, what do you consider the consequences of this storm to be with respect to the port? So obviously these folks have a lot of concerns that have nothing to do with the port, but I wanted them just to focus on what happens when this event occurs at the port. And I did the same thing here in Providence, um, interviewed 27 different people who make up that cluster uh, here in Providence. So that included the EDC, Save the Bay, um, Coastal Resources Centers. In fact, there's quite a few people in this room that I interviewed. Um, and presented a Category 3 hurricane to, to those people. So quite a few from the, from the public sector, especially the state public sector. Um, but, you know, they spanned public, private, nonprofit, and then all scales um, geographically. So again, the question was, what would be the consequences of this major hurricane um, on the port? And, and, and what would the consequences be for you and your, the, you know, your stakeholder group? So these fell out into three broad categories. There's the direct damages, um, which are pretty easy to assess. You know, this is damage to the buildings themselves, damage to the cargo at the port, um, damage to the road and the rail. Uh, indirect costs, so this is um, consequences that are not the direct impact of the event, but things like delays in commerce, um, costs go up, gas prices go up, things along those lines. They're you know, things that can be quantified, but they're a little bit more difficult to quantify. So just an example from uh, Gulfport. This was one of my respondents who said, well, the port was flattened. There was nothing here. Our birth collapsed. Eight weeks later, the channel was okayed. And later, beyond that, they finally brought a ship in. But it was, of course, restricted to daylight use only. A lot of the na navigational aids had been knocked down, and the infrastructure was completely gone. So this is direct damage to the port. The port was flattened. Um, and delays in commerce, which, was a, a, which is an indirect cost. And then the last category is intangible consequences. And these are things that are very difficult to quantify in economic terms, um, but also critically important. Um, so for example, in Providence here, 
One of the respondents said, the big fear that I have is that the port plays such a key role in our energy security. Someone that's involved in energy security and the planning and the government should have another plan on what would happen if we couldn't bring in gasoline for cars and home heating oil and jet fuel. There was a fire at the Motiva dock four or five years ago, and that was one terminal, not the whole port. And there was no gasoline in the Shell stations and in many other stations in southeastern Massachusetts and Rhode Island and Connecticut just because that one terminal, Motiva, was shut down. And gas prices doubled. So, of course, we saw that um, after Sandy, too. So what I found through these interviews was that um, there was a lot of concern for consequences that are difficult to quantify in economic terms, these intangibles. Um, th there was, uh, in, in Gulfport, you know, the, the most concerns were in that intangible category. Uh, Providence, there were, the direct damages were pretty evenly split between Providence and Gulfport in the direct damages category. And fewer mentions of these indirect costs. So these different types of cons consequences can be evaluated with, with ex some existing methods. Direct damages, you know, you can look at replacement and repair values. Um, you can look at how much money went out for disaster assistance. Um, same with indirect costs. You, there's input-output models and other techniques. But the intangible consequences really demand a qualitative assessment. And um, the 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 qualitative assessment is also necessary for thinking about impacts of disasters before they happen. So these things that fall into the direct and indirect categories, you can, you can quantify them after your event, but if you want to quantify them before the event, it's, it's a little bit harder to do. So I'm running out of time here, so let me... So I also looked at the, the formal planning and policy documents. These are from Gulfport. I looked at about 18 um, documents that addressed impacts and the port of Gulfport. And in the, in, the doc, in the formalized planning and policy documents, I found that um, they, they, most of the justifications for building resilience in these planning and policies fell into this direct damages category. So even though the, in Gulfport, the perceptions of the, of the stakeholders were all about these intangible consequences. The things that actually made it into the documents and into the formal policy were just the direct damages that had already been, been quantified from an economic perspective. So this is, um, this, is a, this is just the plans for restoration and rebuilding of the port. Um, but again, they focus extensively on the direct damages, but not so much on these others. So to bring it back to this decision in Gulfport that happened three weeks ago, the, when the Port Commission got together to vote on whether or not to move forward with their elevation plan, they, they, the quote that they, you know, that they published in the newspaper was a Port Commissioner who said, we need to move forward, we need to get jobs, and we need to get moving and get this behind us. And their way to do that was to take this money that was set aside for hurricane resistance and invest it in deepening the channel and creating jobs in the, in the short term. And so, of course, the, you know, the, that's, a good, that's a good economic decision for the port itself, perhaps, um, but not necessarily for that stakeholder cluster that's dependent on the long-term functionality of the port. So what we've learned so far in this is that identifying risks on a sectoral scale in terms of a, a port or an airport or, or a utility requires some level of a qualitative approach that you can't just depend on quantitative methods um, to, to understand what these kinds of impacts and consequences are. And that, though, that qualitative approach is typically undervalued in formal planning and policy. And in Gulfport, there was a real disconnect between the concerns of the stakeholders and, uh, and what was actually being re represented in the formal documents and uh, of the planning and, and policy documents. And finally, that the investment decision that the port is making, although a good decision for the port itself, is, is really not necessarily a good decision for that wider community. And that there isn't a mechanism for the concerns of those stakeholders to, uh, to, to make it into the decision-making process for the port. 
So I'll suggest you know, that we consider this kind of a framework where we engage the fuller network of stakeholders, um, that we think about things like ports and airports and, and utilities as public infrastructure, even if they're operated as if they're private uh, and you know, most concerned with generating profits. And that we move to embrace more qualitative uh, assessment methodologies in, in our risk assessments. So I went a little bit over, but that's. This is forward, and it's back, and that's your laser. <clears throat> I want to thank uh, Susan for the opportunity uh, to speak here. This has been a fascinating symposium. I've learned a lot, and uh, I, I joke with Susan that uh, the reason she asked me is that I was the only person from the Coast Guard that she could find that would say the words climate and change together. Uh, it's not quite that, that bad. We certainly recognize that the oceans are, are warmer, that we have sea level rise, and storms are more severe, and uh, that the Arctic is changing. So that's, that's pretty well settled, but what you'll see is a reluctance to say uh, anything about the connection between human activities, carbon, and the ultimate uh, effects of that. I am much more uh, open about that uh, for a couple of reasons, but one primary reason is I have four young grandchildren who I believe will see the year 2100. So I'm thinking ahead to that as something that, uh, and I've even crafted a little uh, don't blame grandpa letter in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, we, we were paying attention to some of this stuff. So Susan already uh, said that uh, this is a lot to give you in 15 minutes. So I am going to have, I'll apologize ahead of time for a pace that's going to be uh, a little brisk. And I'm going to start off with uh, taking advantage of the recent events. Hurricane Sandy, this is Station New York, and the debris that you see in the parking lot there are all the docks. <clears throat> this is on Staten Island. So obviously not operating. Another picture I like is from the other view. You can see this 300 plus pound cast iron bollard that was just thrown up like a kid's toy. Barnegat Light, flooded. Station Atlantic City, flooded. And Station Sandy Hook was particularly badly damaged. And this is sort of the sad task of two petty officers to save the personal protective equipment, salvage what they can, and get the crews back uh, on, the, on the water again. <clears throat> and as you know, the effects reached all the way out to Lake Erie and Cleveland. This is a semi-hardened lighthouse. And I don't have the damage assessment on it, but it's sure getting hit pretty hard. It has sheet pilings around it, but they aren't doing very much. I also chose to uh, take, I did, uh, sorry about that. <clears throat> I also chose to uh, look at Gulfport. In Gulfport, uh, Katrina uh, just really devastated our Coast Guard station in Gulfport, substantial steel structure that was basically obliterated. I don't remember your term, uh, Austin, but obliterated okay <clears throat> so here's I'm doing something wrong here um, so here's what it looks like today uh, the new uh, adaptive approach to this mission cr critical functions on the second floor breakaway walls allow storm surge to go through the building it's a lead silver designed for cat 4 and uh oh 18 feet of storm surge probably not enough but even before it was built, completed, and occupied 90% uh, through this, we ended up with Gustav three years later hitting us, and all of the temporary trailers were damaged, construction materials, construction equipment all damaged. 
okay, that was probably a fluke. Until we saw Isaac in 2012 where we got inundated again. The basic message here is you can't remove these to a more sensible location from a storm damage stand standpoint because that's where the Coast Guard does its job. Uh, impacts on facilities include loss of power, inability to access, just can't get there, can't operate boats, loss of potable water and sewage, and then personnel living in the vicinity may be affected. Very important, after Katrina, we had to make sure that the families of the people who are out there responding were safe because you don't want to be flying a helicopter wondering if your wife and kids are in harm's way. So we have a very elaborate process to make sure we know where people are. Uh, impacts to waterways, and this is a lesson from Sandy, storm debris, obstructions, the depth reduced in navigation channels because of moving sand, loss of aids navigation, traffic that can't get around oil spills, and a toxic brew in urban areas, which I'll show in a second. <clears throat> we also found that the oil terminals and the container terminals were inoperative, inoperative because of power loss and flooding, which was pretty, uh, pretty substantial. Uh, big piece of storm debris on Staten Island. The willow here is replacing an aid to navigation that was, uh, and I don't remember how many hundred were moved or lost, but big, big effort to get these back. Uh, Monday of the storm, there was a 350,000 gallon diesel spill at Motiva that went into the Arthur Kill, which was uh, a huge problem. This is a strike team member doing some analysis of the oil. This toxic brew that I mentioned, in addition to the leaves here, there's a combination of oil from the Motiva spill and a whole lot of sewage. But to add a little excitement to it, there's uh, energized electric cables underneath this. So you didn't want to leave your apartment. It was, uh, it was not a good place to be. Uh, resiliency, we are uh, doing, taking some steps to make the ports more resilient through a marine transportation system recovery uh, group. There are three positions out of uh, the New England states and they work with the Army Corps, TSA, and industry to try to come up with a more resilient port structure. But we have many lessons learned, and I'm going to go through a few of these uh, from Sandy. Transportation fuels in the affected area were, were critical. We first of all have an increased demand. Everybody listens to FEMA, or a lot of people do. Top off your tanks. People went out, topped off their tanks for all their vehicles. And then they started using uh, electric generators that use gasoline as fuel, so there were a lot of jerry jugs going around too. Increased demand, and at the same time, we had a decreased supply. Uh, Post-event surveys of the waterways are absolutely critical. Under the Ports and Waterways Safety Act, the captain of the port has enormous authorities in the port. In New York, they shut everything down because we didn't know what was in the waterway. We didn't want to see another oil spill on top of everything else. So uh, one other lesson, focus on the commodities, not the queue. The next diesel barge going out probably isn't as important as the ethanol and the gasoline barges that are behind it. Security cannot be waived. So what we had to do to mitigate this was when barriers and electronics were breached, we had to bring in guards to make sure that uh, the facilities were still uh, secure. So a couple more. The supply chain was choked. Plenty of fuel in the port of New York and New Jersey. No way to get it anywhere. There were uh, pumps that weren't working. And it was uh, a real difficult time to try to get it back into, into service. President Obama said he wanted to see red tape removed, and I think we did a reasonably good job of that. Uh, sort of a rare event, we got Jones Act waived. Commercial driver's license, hours were waived. Uh, the wait for trucks was waived, and EPA waived vapor recovery because we didn't have the power to, to do that. <clears throat> so we spoke yesterday a little bit about the inundation of the 
uh, I-95 rail bed, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time with that, but just to show a couple of neat pictures here, that the rail bed actually was not operated, operative, and that there were some stations that were in pretty deep trouble. One of the mitigations for this is uh, from MARAD, America's Marine Highways. It's sort of a fledgling program in a lot of respects, only about 13% of the domestic cargo goes on America's marine highways, uh, down from 26% earlier. Uh, but the goals are good, Remose, re reduce greenhouse gas emissions, reduce road con congestion, fatalities, injuries, noise, and the tremendous cost of rebuilding infrastructure from the pounding that uh, trucks uh, give to roads and bridges. And here's the uh, M95 part of the uh, America's Marine Highways. Just looking at some subroutes in the Northeast, there should be one coming up into Providence. But it, the whole idea is more efficient uh, transportation by barge. You get about 150 ton miles of freight per gallon with trucks, 413 with uh, rail, and then as much as 567 with a tug barge combination. Plus you get the trucks off the road, which pleases everyone that's not driving a truck. Uh, another mitigation uh, action that has been taken in the international theater are emission control areas. This is a reduction of SOX and NOx uh, within 200, basically 200 miles of our coast. And by 2015, ships have to comply with this and reduce to about a thousand, to a thousand or less than a thousand parts per million of sulfur. Uh, tough thing to do. The only way you can really do it is by going to ultra low sulfur diesel or scrubbers or LNG. We have no bunkering for LNG, so LNG isn't a great solution at the moment, but Europe is starting to, to do that. Uh, some people don't want this to happen. Governor Parnell has sued. Uh, Let's see, uh, Hillary Clinton, the Coast Guard, uh, well, everyone, Department <laughs> of State. And the basic argument uh, is that the Secretary of State accepted the ECA amendment, which is a non-self-executing and international commitment without the approval of the President and Senate. So we'll see how this plays out, but uh, it, it seems like the rest of the world is accepting this, this burden of going to ultra-low sulfur diesel. I'm going to just breeze through the next two slides. The message here, if you read these, are that the, the Navy has priority areas that are very consistent with what the Coast Guard's priority areas are. And the Coast Guard has actually, through Arctic Shield, done a, a substantial outreach to the Arctic uh, this year. And the goal is to develop a lasting plan for safety and effective coordination of Coast Guard missions in the future, looking forward in the Arctic. And obviously, Northwest Passage and the other passages are, that will open up are the driving force for this. And we know that uh, we hit a record low in Arctic sea ice. You saw that yesterday. And that the routes will be regularly open. And you can pick a number, uh, pessimistically, 2030, 2035. The problem that we have in the Coast Guard is the Healy, which is the only active Coast Guard icebreaker, the only U.S. Coast Guard uh, U.S. icebreaker, is a medium-duty research breaker. Uh, did well breaking into Nome, but the polar class breakers would have done a heck of a lot better job. Um, the Polar Star, which was built in '76 is undergoing a $53, $56 million overhaul that should return to service by the end of next year. The Polar Sea is out of commission, and quite frankly, I don't think that is going to uh, end up being uh, uh, viable in the future. But it takes 10 years from the glint in your eye saying, I want to build one of these things, till it's actually ramming ice in the Arctic. It's a tremendously long lead time. So I'm going to close with three top concerns. Law of the Sea Treaty, our new Secretary of Defense, I guess. Um, this, uh, as you well know, is the, we're the only major industrialized nation that has not ratified the treaty. 
It has impacts not only in the Arctic, in my world of work, Head Harbor Passage going into Passamaquoddy Bay. Uh, Canadians have their elbows out and they say no, and we have no venue to really uh, try to argue that. And the next one that was brought up yesterday, search and rescue, we are moving from episodic demand to a sustained seasonal demand in those areas. So that's a, uh, that's a big difference. And the last thing is, we don't know everything we need to about oil pollution response. We've done a couple of drills up in the Arctic, but when you mix oil and ice and water, it makes it an awful lot more difficult. So we're, uh, we're trying to learn those lessons as we go along. Did I make it, Susan? Yeah. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Paul Heilman. I'm a lawyer. I represent mostly port authorities. And I'm going to take this to a bit more granular level and talk about what good things are happening as opposed to all these bad things that are happening. And uh, so we're going to start, and, and I'm going to focus pretty much at the state level. Uh, the, let's see if I can make this work. Okay. There is something called the California Air Resources Board, or CARB, which is the air and water pollution, excuse me, air and uh, point source and, uh, and moving uh, regulatory authority in California. It was set up back in the mid-60s by that noted environmentalist, uh, then Governor Ronald Reagan. I guess most of you don't remember who Ronald Reagan was, okay. Uh, in any event, um, and in the last 10 to 15 years, CARB has gotten very active in uh, regulating emissions of both uh, various toxic gases, SOx and NOx and such, and also greenhouse gases, as that's become a bigger and bigger uh, issue. And in 2004, 2005, when you saw the ports expanding rapidly, both the San Pedro ports, uh, LA and Long Beach, which is responsible for about 40% of all the containers that come into this country, and also Oakland, which is a very large export port for uh, grain and other foodstuffs to the Far East, and also a big import port, um, you, you saw this uh, uh, rush of public opinion against port trucking. Uh, most of the material that comes, or most of the containers that come into ports and leave ports for local destinations. In other words, if they're coming into LA and Long Beach and it's going to be in the LA metro area, SMSA, or coming into Oakland for the San Francisco Bay area, those are going to go on trucks. If they're coming, going longer, 500 miles into the interior, Denver, Chicago, wherever they're going, Houston, they're going by train. So the rail is a completely separate issue, but pretty much everything local moves by trucks. And the initial uh, uh, focus of the regulation was on uh, gas emissions, uh, non-greenhouse gas emissions, primarily SOx uh, and, uh, and NOx, uh, and public port authorities, which are the entities that run these things, are public entities. They are responsible to the state of California, but they basically have uh, locally appointed boards of port commissioners who are responsible for the ultimate decision making, and their meetings are all open uh, under the Public Records Public Open Meetings Act. And so as a result of that, you had people coming in with uh, little babies who had asthma and standing up in front saying, my kid's being killed by these trucks coming in. And they were able to make pretty convincing cases by showing uh, circumference, excuse me, concentric rings of asthma deaths and asthma serious uh, uh, health impacts that were sort of falling off as you went further and further from the port. And so the ports came under tremendous political pressure independently of CARB. CARB came under pressure to do something about 
the SOX and NOx emission of the trucks that were coming in and out of these ports. And you'd see them lined up 100, 150, sometimes 200 trucks long. Each one of those has, at least in the most part, a 40-foot container on a chassis behind it. So it's sitting there idling for three hours, five hours, and there's some nasty stuff coming out of the smokestacks of those things. So in 2009, the CARB regulations went into effect and said, basically, as of 2010, we're not going to let anything into a port that was built, or out of a port, that was built prior to 1989. And there's been a gradual phase in with that of all these old trucks being taken off the road or put to at least some other use somewhere outside the port uh, uh, facilities. And by 2014, which is just around the corner, anything that was built after, basically you have to have something that was built 2007 or after meeting the federal standards for that uh, emissions, which is something like 5%, for example, of the particulate matter that a pre-89 truck would emit. So instead of having this black gunk coming out of the smokestacks, you have very small amounts of gunk coming out of the smokestacks. Now, this started at the same time uh, that we were watching a major economic collapse going on in this country and around the world. And as a result, uh, you had a tremendous fall off in pollution anyway because there was a lot less cargo being shipped. Um, but at the same time, the funding was already set up for this, so they actually glided through the 2008-2009 recession better than you would think they might have. The state of California and a variety of other sources made it such that the Port of Los Angeles was able to come up with about $450 million to help uh, mitigate the financial effects of these on the truckers. Uh, just to take a, a brief detour um, to explain the parties here, you have the port itself, which is a public entity. It leases space, brown leases usually, to marine terminal operators, who are the people that uh, are responsible for getting the containers from the ships onto a bomb cart or a chassis or a rail car, and then storing them or immediately moving them out of the port. Then you have the inland infrastructure, which is what uh, a couple of the prior speakers have pointed out is uh, most uh, uh, vulnerable to uh, uh, being flooded out. And then you have uh, the trucking companies, which are basically just dispatchers and brokers. And then you have the independent truckers. And the truckers are at the bottom end of the economic food chain. The average uh, income for a trucker is somewhere around thirty dollars to $35,000 a year. They are working in the same uh, milieu as, on the West Coast, the ILWU, the Longshore uh, workers out there, and on the East Coast, the ILA. On the West Coast, the ILWU average uh, uh, annual cash compensation, not including benefits, with uh, mandatory overtime is a little over $100,000 a year. Uh, the trucker, so the truckers are making, you know, $28,000, $30,000 a year, no benefits, they're independent contractors. The ILWU members are making $100,000 a year and they have first dollar health coverage, so there's a little bit of uh, antagonism there, shall we say. Um, so anyway, Los Angeles was able to make close to a half a billion dollars available to buy new trucks, and that has worked pretty well. In fact, it works so well that they've now put meter, uh, GPS uh, locators on these trucks because uh, they were suddenly, since people got these new trucks, they were using for things other than going back and forth to the port. And they had to kind <clears> of <throat> collapse uh, that process. Okay. Uh, it has been a tremendously successful uh, story in California. The reduction in greenhouse gases has been somewhere in the order of about an 80% reduction. They were talking about reducing to the 1990 levels by 2020. Well, they've already accomplished that. In addition, uh, the new more efficient trucks and the use of uh, natural gas uh, powered trucks, uh, uh, CNG, LNG, uh, yard equipment has also reduced fuel costs quite considerably. Okay. Things start in California and then they go east. Uh, what we've seen in these clean trucks programs is a migration north, uh, Seattle. Uh, so you've got now the big four ports on the American West Coast, uh, LA and Long Beach, which are really one port, but two different political subdivisions with a fence down the middle, uh, Oakland and Seattle. 
the other big ports on the West Coast are Vancouver and Prince Rupert, and the Canadians tend to be a little more aggressive about the regulatory issues here, and Prince Rupert is halfway up the coast to Alaska, so they don't have the kind of local pressure. Um, so you've seen a fairly substantial move on the West Coast to much cleaner trucks, to reductions in both particulate matter, uh, the uh, poison, the uh, SOx and NOx uh, gases, and the two greenhouse gases. You've also seen that, as I said, move east. Um, the, the truck issue is, is much more complicated than just the emissions. Uh, this issue of the economics of it, them all being independent contractors since 1982 and, and working in the same milieu with people who are making three, four, five times as much as they are union labor uh, has been a big issue. Um, and when they're being paid by the move, as these truckers are, sitting there waiting for five hours in line is very unpopular. Uh, it's got a very negative environmental effect, it uses a lot of fuel, and so what you've seen is these appointment systems to try to move the trucks through much quicker. That has a tremendous salutary effect on a reduction in polluting and greenhouse gases. Um, back in 2008, uh, the Port, of, uh, Port Authority of New York, New Jersey issued a, uh, an official news bulletin saying that they were not considering a truck appointment system, which of course meant that they were pretty much ready to launch it. Um, for those of you that deal with Port Authorities, you'll know what I mean. Um, so then uh, we have a, a comprehensive clean trucks program in uh, New York, uh, Massport, uh, last, two years ago, I guess, uh, also launched their program. So you're seeing that starting to move east. Um, it's part of a larger problem, but it is an important part of it. Okay, uh, I've mentioned the fact that there is this labor component. The Teamsters have been uh, very aggressive in trying to organize truck drivers. Uh, the drivers are independent contractors, they are not employees, at least that's what the courts have held so far. The Teamsters take the position that really they're employees and they should be treated as employees. And there's a huge difference for those of you taking antitrust law between employees and independent contractors. Employees are entitled to organize under the National Labor Relations Act. Independent contractors, if they do the same thing, are committing a per se violation of Section 1 of the Sherman Act. And uh, probably somebody gets thrown in jail for that if you get a sufficiently aggressive prosecutor. Um, so what you've seen is environmental groups and, um, and un labor unions, most particularly the Teamsters and its port division, coming together to apply political pressure on ports and on the uh, various uh, uh, suppliers of uh, services at the ports any way they can to uh, uh, basically try to move back to an employee model. And the economic argument for this is that the truckers are so far down at the bottom end of the the food chain, that there's no way for them to adequately maintain their trucks. There just isn't enough money in the system for them to do that, and that you really need to have a corporate employer-employee relationship in order to make this thing work. Uh, that's not surprisingly the subject of um, uh, great debate and uh, lots of litigation. Um, the Federal Maritime Commission, which is the federal agency that regulates uh, ocean shipping and ports, got into the LA Long Beach Clean Trucks program because the mayor of Los Angeles, uh, Villagrosa, had decided that uh, LA was gonna require that anybody driving a truck had to be a statutory employee, and therefore the Teamsters could organize and unionize the, uh, the truck drivers. Uh, the Federal Maritime Commission went to the Federal District Court in the District of Columbia and uh, uh, lost. Uh, however, the ATA, the American Trucking Associations, which is sort of the umbrella group of the uh, truck owners, uh, took the same case, uh, some of the same issues under something called the Federal Aviation Authorization Adjustment Amendments Act, F quad A, uh, to a federal court in, uh, uh, in California, lost, went up to the Ninth Circuit, got it reversed, won, went back to trial, lost again, went up to the Ninth Circuit, won, and they filed, the city of Los Angeles filed for cert, 
about six months ago. I haven't seen any announcement as to whether that's been granted or not. Uh, but basically, there is federal preemption of certain attempts to regulate interstate commerce, and in particular, trucking. Um, there's some health and safety exceptions, but basically state and local governments have very limited ability to regulate trucking. Which brings up the interesting question, well, how could they imply, uh, apply these uh, truck pro clean truck programs? And basically, uh, I have not been involved in the litigation for any of the parties, so I can speculate all I want. Uh, I think that, uh, well, it was mentioned in some uh, F Quad A reauthorization hearings that the clean trucks programs probably violate the F Quad A. Uh, the trucking industry has decided that uh, it really doesn't want to take that on, in particular because a lot of their members are getting their drivers new trucks that are being subsidized by the state and government and by federal money. So as long as there isn't a major economic consequence to it, you know, you sort of let it go. Um, the other thing that is, I've got, okay, 36 seconds. The other thing that's going on that's significant is shore power. The, the uh, traditional model was that these big container ships would come into port and they would sit there with auxiliary generators running Bunker C, which is some pretty nasty stuff, and it's fine when you're out in the middle of the ocean, I guess, um, but it's not so good in port because you can watch this black gook coming out of the smokestacks. And so what the uh, CARB decided and uh, has been going on around the world is shore power. Um, think of it as, in, in very simple terms as the uh, 12,000 TEU, the Emma Maersk, which is the biggest container ship now, I think, pulls up and they throw a cord over the side and you plug it into the extension, except it's got to be 660 volts. And um, basically, it, it's, um, it, it, it requires a lot of shoreside infrastructure. It's about $7 million per plug. 50% uh, of the container fleets have to be set in 2014. Uh, that's uh, migrating to 100%, I think it's in 20, by 2017. And you do have some problems with different standards around the world. Every ship uh, built in, well, there are about five different power level systems, like uh, 220 in Europe and 110 we have here, 110 volt, 220 volt. Uh, you have a, a mul multiple different options. So you've got some problems setting things up so that they're uh, convertible, but, uh, but they're working on that and making some progress. Um, the last thing I'll mention is slow steaming. It is much cheaper for a, from a fuel standpoint for a uh, container uh, vessel owner to steam at 16 knots than it is at 26 knots. And it also has a significant env environmental benefit. It, the downside is the cargo doesn't get there as fast. And so the just-in-time inventory systems that we rely on in this country don't work so well. So anyway, there's been a lot of arguing back and forth on that. The Federal Maritime Commission has gotten into that. Um, the, uh, the, the results are not in yet, uh, sort of stay tuned for that. Uh, one last thing I'll mention is the clean fuel switch in coastal waters, which the Coast Guard uh, was pointing out to us. Um, you have options of switching to an ultra-low sulfur fuel. California, again leading the country, uh, is making money available for uh, some of the conversions, uh, retrofits for vessels that are um, uh, not currently capable of running the ultra-low sulfur fuel. And uh, uh, that actually should provide for a considerable reduction. Uh, la one last note I'll make is that, and I don't know whether this has been thrown out before, but the general assessment of the amount of greenhouse gases pumped out by ocean shipping is somewhere, depending on who you ask, between 3% and 4% of the total greenhouse gas emission in the world. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. So now we're going to turn to question and answer time. Um, we are running a little bit behind. I want to assure you, all of you, I'm going to remain true to our designated amount of question and answer time. I'm also going to remain true to your break and true to the time allotted for the following panel. I'm going to cut off the, the ending discussion conclusion because that's all me and you don't need to hear any more from me. Um, so Where are we right now? 
Where well, are what's we? What's the time? You have 15 minutes for Q&A. And what we're going to do is we're going to rotate between this side of the room, that side of the room. Uh, Julia and I will take the mics, um, ask people to identify themselves, and we'll be sure to monitor our webinar folks as well for questions. So I'll let you call on people as you like. Sure. Um, well, why don't we start with you? Hi, my name is Mark Fialkoff. I'm a second year at, at the law school. The British tried uh, what, Mr. Becker, you were approaching with a shareholder or stakeholder type invest in sort of involvement, but it failed because the regional organizations that were supporting the ports have collapsed since the British got rid of it through the comprehensive spending review. How you looked at this in your my, in your approach and how when stakeholders sort of fall out of the picture or their sort of antagonism when the ports then later say we don't want to go to a local authority to deal with or be engaged in, in talking to you because we're bigger than you. So has, has that been looked at? How do I know if it's on? on? Okay. I'm not familiar with the example that you gave, but I, but I mean I think there's there isn't necessarily a lot of incentive for the port itself to engage that broader stakeholder network. Um, there might be, if it's a public port authority, some incentive. Um, but, um, but yeah, how, how you compel the, in that, that fuller sort of more holistic engagement, I think it depends on the situation. Maybe there's ways to do it through like the environmental assessment process. Um, or maybe through the National Flood Insurance Program. Um, but it's certainly a challenge, and I think it's, that's kind of the, the paradigm shift that we need to move towards, is, is, is finding ways to engage those other stakeholders, um, and not just depending on the port to make a decision that's best for that whole community. I don't know if that answers your question. I'm, Yes. OK, uh, thank you. My name is Kirsten Selvig. I'm from the Ministry of Fisheries and Coastal Affairs in Norway. Firstly, thank you for your presentation, where you all uh, stressed the importance of the ports as uh, service providers to the modern society. And that's why I would like to ask you a question. Since it's very critical uh, services we get through the ports, have you considered for security and safety matters uh, what sort of tools you have to enforce the, for example, the port of Mississippi to uh, do the needed uh, improvement in the port? You mentioned the elevation. Have you any possible uh, legal uh, tools to do that? Or have you considered to do that because I think we maybe see the picture of the three small pigs again that we know that will come back to us. And uh, since this is very critical infrastructure and services for the modern society, very vulnerable, what do you foresee for a preventive measure for upcoming uh, storms and etc.? Thank you. Where are you? Uh, I guess I'll take a first crack on just my own thoughts on the matter. Um, I find sometimes compulsion uh, to be a double-edged sword in that when you require an entity to do something that's in its own self-interest, uh, there's sometimes a backlash, that it becomes a game in order to meet the federal requirement or to meet the requirements generally. Uh, I find a, a better approach, personally, is to d identify the barriers as to why a port would be uninterested in taking the next step and becoming more, um, uh, more resilient to climate effects. And some of the barriers include a short time frame. Sometimes they're unaware of the impacts and the time frame of the impacts. Sometimes it's pure economics, that every dollar spent today is a dollar that they don't use in some other way today uh, for an impact that may or may not occur. And sometimes it's, it's just, um, well, it, it's sort of a, a not in my immediate interest kind of concern. And I think that if through the kinds of coalitions that, that Austin is talking about, raising awareness on the long-term viability of the port, 
and perhaps some financial incentives in order to focus not only on their budgets, but on the, air, the region's budget and how important it is to the region, you can overcome some of those barriers. Yeah, I would add, um, you know, I, I think the federal government could shift emphasis from, some emphasis from spending money on cleanup to spending money on risk mitigation. Um, that right now there's a lot of disincentives for the ports. They know that, you know, they need to protect their own assets, sure, and, and you know, they do that through insurance or through design. Um, but in the case of a real catastrophe like a Sandy or, or a Katrina, they're well aware that the government's going to come in and, you know, spend the money to do the cleanup and to fund the project to get them back, you know, back up and running again. So I think if, you know, if the, if the federal government would, would, and I'm not sure what the mechanism would be, maybe it's through FEMA, or, but um, would fund some, some projects up front and try to incentive, incentivize that a little bit, that would be another help. Yeah, uh, there is, uh, shall we say, a debate as to whether we really have any national infrastructure plan in this country. Um, my particular vote is that we don't. Uh, it's a series of very balkanized uh, uh, small uh, governmental entities, and each port is comp has competitors. Uh, you look at the West Coast, and the ports are basically they're self-funding entities. They make the, they make their living. They pay their the people that work there out of revenues from uh, ocean uh, container vessels mostly, and, and bulk carriers coming in and, and docking. Uh, at the wharfs there and running stuff through their marine terminals and the rent that flows back to the ports is what funds everything. And so if you start spending money on things that are uh, risk mitigation five or ten years down the road, you have to deal with the fact that that's, you're going to have to get the money from somewhere. Uh, and the federal government's not real good at handing that out right now um, for a whole bunch of reasons. Uh, I mean you had Tiger grants and things like that. but. Um, you know, the, the, we're talking about some pretty major, I think, uh, expenditures that need to be made. Um, and you have a very balkanized system that's on a sort of a today, tomorrow competitive uh, framework, and sometimes it's a little difficult to get beyond that. So. Oh, okay. It is. <laughs> Do we have any quick questions in the meantime? Yes. Um, Michael Berger from here at Roger Williams. I have a question um, for you, Ron. Um, yesterday we had a panel um, on which Kirsten sat that talked about the opening up of the Arctic and the development of the Arctic. And I know that there is some work being done currently to try and locate a Arctic port for the U.S. because currently we lack, I think the Coast Guard lacks a sufficient facility up there or is under the impression that it lacks sufficient resources there and then there's also the sense that as the Arctic becomes an increasingly important shipping lane that we might need a commercial port there and I was wondering if you could just kind of comment on port developments in Alaska and in the Arctic. Uh, great, great question. I don't have a lot of information about the plans but I know the Commandant is dealing with <clears throat> that issue right now. This Arctic Shield uh, exercise where they went up to I think 33 individual towns and 27 schools and they they actually reached out to about 5,000 people. <clears throat> One of the purposes of that was try to identify what would be a good place to put some infrastructure. Uh, I learned that a uh, helicopter flight from the 17th district base is 10 hours and you can't you can't fly a helicopter for 10 hours, they don't have the endurance. So you have to send along a C-130, and then once you get wherever you're going, uh, there's no fuel, there's no hangar, there's no spares, there's no birthing. <clears throat> so it's a huge problem, uh, vast area. So I think the, to answer your question more directly, trying to find that place that would become the next center other than Juneau, or Kodiak rather, <laughs> Uh, that would provide forward services is one of the top priorities, but I don't know what the candidates are. <clears throat> Build an icebreaker, I think, is one of the first uh, <laughs> priorities. <laughs> Forget this. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Sorry about 
Pierce, University of New England. Um, is, I had the opportunity to visit the port of Bremerhaven in Germany last year, which was becoming uh, the ground central for Germany's renewable energy and industry. Um, I think most of the discussion I've heard is focused on transportation. Um, and are any ports, either medium or large size in the United States, looking more seriously at developing the renewable energy, manufacturing, infrastructure, transportation networks? Or are we all still focused on the old economy? Um, I, I know that it depends on what, what kind of renewal, renewable energy you're talking about, but um, I know that in Baltimore there has been uh, some serious consideration given to the offshore uh, wind generating facilities because the transportation of the blades on those things is a huge, it's a heavy lift problem. Uh, and they're very fragile, uh, surprisingly. And so they've been looking at how do they move those things how do you service the, uh, the offshore uh, wind generating equipment? Um, they're, they're doing things on a local level. It's not, that, it's not necessarily you know, sustainable energy, but uh, trying to move towards more uh, LNG, more electrical powered uh, yard equipment, which is a, a not insignificant source of, uh, of air pollution uh, in Los Angeles and Long Beach in particular. So that's what I know. There, there are people in this room that know a lot more about this, but Quonset, New Bedford are two ports that are vying <clears throat> for Cape Wind's initial work, and then should Block Island wind uh, take off, that's, that's another opportunity. Um, <clears throat> there was a pretty extensive study done not long ago on all the ports in the, in the region that could support renewable energy projects, and uh, I can get you that that link if you'd like. Mike, I think we have time for one more question. Okay, do we have one more question around? I, I have a quick question, if, we, if there aren't any others. Is there Moderator's any prerogative, go for it. Okay, well, uh, it, it, let, let me just start by giving my observation. I think it's, uh, the, the topic was great, presentations were great, um, you know, it, in general, it seems as though we talk so often about the, um, you know, the, the human and natural resources consequences of sea level rise and climate change and so on. So it is nice to take some time to, to focus on some of the business aspects of it. But one of the questions uh, that I had was, I think it was to follow up on, uh, on, on one comment that you had made, Paul, about uh, you know, using $7 million extension cords now to, uh, to fuel up or, or to uh, energize these ships while they're in port. Have you or uh, has come across or been aware of any emerging businesses that have sort of sprung up as a result of these new initiatives to be sensitive to these uh, environmental yeah, the concerns? The shore power stuff, I think, has been mostly the usual suspects, uh, the big maritime marine construction, mm -hmm. um, marine engineering companies. The uh, LNG and the yard equipment, uh, the, the, the low emission yard equipment has uh, has been a very fertile ground for mm. small businesses uh, because it, particularly in California they've got all sorts of set-asides uh, and, and some of those set-asides are for small businesses so and, and, and plus it's something that you don't have huge barriers to entry right. you don't need to have you know a half a billion dollars uh, and 10,000 employees to set one of those up so it, it's it you know the small small relatively inexpensive equipment does seem to have attracted a lot of um, garage entrepreneurs. Right. And you probably get more, you know, sort of interesting ideas <laughs> from them and sometimes breakthrough technologies than you will from, uh, you know, Moffat and Nichols or CH2M Hill. It'll be interesting to see how that develops. Okay. We all set? We're all set. Please join me in thanking our panel. Thank you. We are going to break.